But let's talk about George Albert Bernard, 1st Texas Infantry. He was born on January 5, 1843 in Galveston Island, Texas. His mother, Caroline, was, a, a, was an English immigrant, and she was a widow. And as soon as she went to Galveston, she married George's father. But unfortunately, that marriage didn't last very long. So she was divorced and back in the 1850s. That was a scandalous thing, I'm sure. But she was divorced. And George, um, he joined the militia as soon as he could before the war broke out. He was part of the Lone Star Guard Rifles. And uh, he was involved in the capture of, Mat of the militia seized Matagorda Bay from the Federals. And it's really interesting that he was involved in the Civil War even before the firing of Fort Sumter. And so as soon as Fort Sumter was fired, when they arrived in Richmond, he actually was enlisted in, in uh, Company L of the 1st Texas Infantry. And... And this photo, I believe it was taken in Richmond as soon as they arrived. And this is a really good photo of a young color sergeant Bernard at the beginning of the war. And there we go. There's Elkins Landing. And George was actually um, became the color sergeant because at Elkins Landing on May 7th, 1862, um, they were guarding the Texas Brigade, guarding the, uh, the rear of General Joseph Johnson's army retreating to Williamsburg, Virginia. And General George McClellan said, you know, I could take Richmond in 90 days. Well, I think the Texans thought differently. Uh, General McClellan said, you know, he boasted, you know, I can take them, you know, that's no problem. Well, it was a problem for General McClellan to see if soon find out because the Texas Brigade was um, at the rear part of General Johnson's retreat. And George was at the Battle of Elkins Landing on May 7th. And they were charging, and he's right next to a soldier who was shot, the color bear that was shot. And the color bear was shot in the shoulder, so he dropped the flag, and George picked it up. And George was really enthusiastic when he charged. He was about 50 yards ahead of the first Texas, and they said, George, you know, you need to slow down and come back there. And George said, I'll be, if I'm ever going to come back. So A.T. Rainey, Alexis T. Rainey, the first Texas uh Commanding officer at the time was so impressed that the next day on March 8th, uh, he made George the permanent color bearer of the 1st Texas Infantry. And that's how he carried the Lone Star flag. And unfortunately, Colonel Rainey was, was, uh, was wounded at the Battle of Gaines Mill on June 27, 1862. And he was actually, the bullet entered from his wrist and tore up his arm. And it was a really painful wound, so he came back to Texas and he never joined the uh, brigade again, but he made George Bernard the permanent color bearer of the 1st Texas Infantry. So there's A.T. Rainey. Um, he was from Palestine, Texas, and he became a Texas state legislature, and uh, he was the one that promoted George Bernard to color sergeant. At the Battle of Second Manassas on August 29th and 30th, 1862, everybody knows that was the Bloody Fifth Texas Great Charge upon the Fifth and Tenth New York Zoabs, the Gary A. Zoabs. And there we go. Now, this painting here, I've only seen it one time. It was on eBay. And it said the Fifth Texas, and I have no idea who made that painting. I think it was probably made around the 1870s or 1880s. But if you can look closely, you see a soldier waving the hat right here. He's like, he's saying, hello, right there. So that's him right there. And, of course, you see the 5th Texas flag right there. Now, does anybody know the history of the 5th Texas Infantry's flag, how that was made? Well, yeah, it was actually it was uh, redesigned from the first national flag of the Confederacy, the Stars and Bars. Well, the Texans said, well, let's make it a Texas flag. And so the 5th Texas made it a flag. And the flag is actually at the Texas Archives in Austin. And unfortunately, it's not on display because I asked to see it, and the archivist said, we don't bring them out unless you're very, very important, like the governor or somebody, senator. But um, at the Battle of Second Manassas, and that's the first Texas flag there that was flown by Color Sergeant Bernard, August 29th and 30th, 1862. And George Bernard kind of chuckled about it later on in life. He said, you know, I know the 5th Texas is the one that did the charge, but I observed the Zoas with their red pantaloons crossing the stream. 
And it's like having them have a big water balloon because the pants were full of water. And George Bernard almost dropped the flag laughing. And so he chuckled about that a little bit later. And so that's an interesting story about the Battle of Second Manassas. But the Battle of Sharpsburg, the first Texas flag was found around Miller's cornfield. And there was the color bearer who was dead. And there was nine color guard that were surrounding the flag. And they were also shot. And George Bernard was carrying the flag so often in bloody bare feet that about the night before the Battle of Sharpsburg, his commanding officer, Major Matt Dale, said, Color Sergeant Bernard, I need to see your feet. And he goes, you're not going anywhere. Your feet are too bloody and cut up. You're going to go to the hospital. And that saved George Bernard's life because his life and his service would have ended on September 17, 1862. So there you go. And that's the flag. And also the Army Northern Virginia flag was also uh, found because not only did they have the Seven Pines flag, the first Texas flag, but also the Army Northern Virginia flag that was given to the uh, brigade was also found right along with the flag. And it was captured and it wasn't given back until 1905 when the U.S. government um, gave back the flags to southern states. And so they had given back the first Texas flag and also they gave back the Army Northern Virginia flag. And George did an article in the, in the Austin American States when he said it wasn't exactly captured because it was found by a Union soldier who got the Medal of Honor. Because during the Civil War, the Confederate flags were guarded and fought for so viciously that any soldier of the Union who captured a flag or got a flag got the Medal of Honor. Thomas Custer, George Armstrong Custer's brother, got two medals of honor because he captured two Confederate flags. And that's the way it was. And But the soldier who found the first Texas flag, it was already on the ground. The color bearer was dead as well as the color sergeant, I mean, as the color guard. But he got the Medal of Honor because he captured a flag. And in 1905, they were given back to Texas as well as other flags all throughout the South. Now let's talk about the Battle of Gettysburg. July 2nd, 1863, everybody knows the story about how Hood's Brigade assaulted the Triangle of Phil Devil's Den and Little Round Top. Well, George Bernard was a very humble man. He always liked to talk about the humorous stories that he observed, but he didn't really talk about his actions much, especially about Gettysburg. And in 1899, he was at a brigade association meeting, and they finally said, George, tell your story. We don't know the whole story about what you did at Gettysburg. People want to know it. We want to know it. So can you please write it down and we'll get it published in the Galveston Daily News. Well, let's talk about how around 4.45 in the afternoon, the Texas Brigade was lined up ready to assault. You had the 3rd Arkansas, the 1st Texas, and the 4th and 5th Texas in that order on the line. Well, as they're getting ready to charge, Smith's New York Battery was zeroing in on the brigade. And some of the cannon fire was killing soldiers of the 4th Texas. As a matter of fact, it decapitated, it decapitated a couple. George is leading the regiment. And he is leading, and he's really, he's really in front of the 1st Texas. And on the Triangular Field, you had the 124th New York Infantry right there at the wall. In charge was Colonel Augustus Van Horn Ellis. And Augustus Van Horn Ellis was quite a man. Before the war, he was a 49er in California digging for gold. Then he got a communication from the king of Hawaii, Kamehameha. And Kamehameha offered him to be the admiral of the Hawaiian Navy. So Ellis actually had sailed from New York all the way down to South America, all the way up and over to Hawaii. And when he went to Hawaii, he, knew, he found that there was no Hawaiian Navy. So he came back to New York. And so he's right there with Major James Cromwell. And the first Texas is coming up, and Benning's Brigade is right behind him. And it was a slugfest at the Triangular Field. Well, this is what George Bernard said. A, ma a modest man by nature, he rarely shared his experience at Gettysburg in writing. His most detailed account appeared in the Galveston Daily News on May 2nd, 1899. As long as I can remember, orders came for our brigade to move off the road, Embersburg Pike, through fields, and was up the rocky side of the mountain, he recounted. It was between 4 and 5 o'clock on the afternoon of July 2nd, 1863. To gain the mountaintop, we had a very hard run 
through shot, shell, canister, and mini balls. As we marched up Little Round Top, I saw in the distance a line of large rocks. I at once thought that they would be a good place to get behind and out of range of the enemy's fire. As luck so happens, my regiment moved to the left and then straight to the front, which put me in direct line with a large rock. As the enemy was giving it to us fast and hot, I thought my best thing to do was run ahead and get behind my rock. Turning around and saying to my color boy, so I was saying to my color guard, come on boys, let's make a rock, let's make a run for yonder rock. The regiment will follow us and get us out of this rain of canister and shell. We made our distance without any loss. Without any loss. After reaching the rock, I thought all was all right, Bernard added, but no such luck was to be for me. I hardly had time to blow out and get wind on the account of the long run when I noticed I had company to share the rock with me. It made me somewhat mad to think that others should try to crowd me out when there was other rocks to be had. And to make matters worse, the other party consisted of four color bearers without their flag of a Georgia regiment of Benning's Brigade. I told them instead of having shelter, they would soon find out it would be the other way and that we would get one of the hardest shellings ever known as these five stands of colors were an attraction. And I would get on top and, as it would be safe there as anywhere else and just as, my, and just as good as any other place. Before I got through talking, my words came true and I did not have time to change my position when a shell hit the top of the rock, and I fell on my back. My flag was shot from the staff, it being broken in three places. The flag went one way, a piece of the staff went the other way, and myself and the remainder of my staff in my hand the other. We were pretty well scattered. How long was I on my back? I don't know, Bernard continued. When I came to, I heard someone say in my company say, see there, Bernard's not dead, and he's trying to get up. Willing hands then ran to me and helped me on my feet. Well, to explain my feelings, my heart felt like a barrel, and I did not know one way from another. When asked if I was hurt, all I heard, all I could say was, I don't know. Someone told me to get to the rear, and I hardly gone 10 feet before one of my company caught me and turned me around as I was going into Yankee lines. I was told afterward that, I would, that all I would say was, I don't know. After getting some distance in the rear, I met a staff officer. He stopped me and wanted to know what command I belonged to. I told him I wanted to know where the hospital was. As I wanted to find out where I was hurt, as I felt as like half my head was, was torn off. He then guided me out of the field to the pike road, turning to me to the right. He said, keep on down the road until you come to some tents, and that is the Texas hospital. Bernard likely had suffered a serious concussion. How and when I got there, I don't know. Somehow, I think it was Tom Sloan, the hospital steward, said, Bernard, drink this. It will do you good as you are in a very bad fix, and it will help cure your pains and give you rest. And in the morning, you shall feel much better. What he gave me in the cup, I do not know. It made me sleep in about 15 minutes. I think it's probably a lot of them. Um, and I did not wake up until the middle of the next day. After waking up, my head, my head felt like it was as big as a camp kettle, and so sore I could hardly touch it. And he spoke, and Bernard spent the next two days in a field hospital. His friends in the first Texas did not participate in the failed grand assault on July 3rd. That became immortalized as Pickett's charge. The opposing armies essentially stared at one another the following day, and then Lee began a slow retreat, um, driving rain towards the Potomac River. After two days in the hospital, my head commenced to feel like myself again. It was on the march back to Virginia, and he took his usual place as color guard in the column. One of the men who had picked up the fallen flag from the battlefield headed it to him. Change my position is what saved my life, he says, as the shale came from the direction I was moved, that I moved from. I was told that after I fell, the rock became a very hot, hot place. The flag had drawn Yankee fire, and it was coming from both sides, kind of a crossfire, I think. The fire from our left came from the two guns Barry and Will George captured, along with the Dutchman that was head wedged between the rocks. He, he looked like an ostrich. He held his head. He had his head and let his feet stick out, and his feet gave away. It was a hot time, and we did not have time for a second thought. And besides, with well-filled haversacks, we were in, inside of Hood's Brigade soldiers. We were known to get their allowance of them. Nothing will make a man fight harder than the prospects of getting two haversacks. And as a rule, the Yanks always carried them. But in this fight, I did not yet get an extra ration, 
as my quota came to after giving my rock. George was a humble man. He didn't really explain the other stuff he did. When he was charging up the field, and as the first Texans made the charge towards 124th New York, they were getting it from the Rosewoods and at the edge of the wheat field. Because it was so full of smoke, regiments, Confederate regiments thought the Texans were Yankees. George had to take the first Texas flag right in front of them and wave and say, don't shoot us, we're Texans. And so they stopped. That really saved a lot of soldiers' lives there at the Triangular Field. I really wish about 30 years ago that we could have had a statue at the Triangular Field of Sergeant Bernard waving that flag. That would have been an awesome sight to see. George didn't talk about Gettysburg at all. He was really, really, really humble man. Sergeant Malachi Reeves of the 1st Texas said that when George climbed the rock to wave the flag, the Yankees went crazy. They were starting to shoot at him. One of the Yankee officers, he heard say, don't shoot that man, he's too brave. That was George Bernard. Well, it was either Smith's New York battery or a battery from the Peach Orchard that fired towards George Bernard. Now, I don't know if they were trying to blast him off or if they just fired a cannon shot and he was unlucky enough to get hit. But George Bernard, on July 29th, 2018, he was awarded the Sons of Confederate Veterans Medal of Honor there at the Texas Civil War Museum where we had the ceremony for it. And his, thankfully, his display of the Confederate Medal of Honor is still on display on the wall there. That's it right there. That's a close up. And that was me. And that's dentist Henry Bernard Bowman. He's a great grandson of George Bernard. He was accepted the medal in the name of the Bernard family. And that's the display right there. And that's the citation that was given to George Bernard. At Chickamauga, George talks about a soldier. They arrived on September 20th. And they're in action, and George is right next to a young Georgia soldier. And he, the, George Bernard says that the soldier came up and said, Texan, I gotta tell you my story. And George was, you know, he's ducking bullets and he had the flag. He said, Okay, tell me what you want me to know. So he told him his story. And George told the soldier, He goes, You know what? You told me it was a little bit personal. Why are you doing this? And the soldier said, Well, I think I'm going to die very soon. And when the young man fired his rifle, right after that, the young man was shot in the head and died. And George never forgot that story. And then George, there for a while, he said that he was wounded at Chickamauga. He also said he was wounded at Knoxville. But we found that he was actually uh, wounded at Chickamauga because he would switch stories around. He said, well, I was wounded at Knoxville. Well, I was wounded at Chickamauga. But it was Chickamauga that he was wounded. And he, that was the end of his carrying the first Texas flag because he couldn't carry it anymore because his shoulder was wounded. George was always wounded on the left side. He, he lost his eyesight, his left eye at Gettysburg because the shell fragment went to his eye. He said that his left side was used up, but his right side was good. And uh, he actually was in the hospital in Knoxville for a few months. And that's during the time that Longstreet Corps went back to the Army of Northern Virginia. George had to walk with another soldier from Georgia to Virginia on foot. When he reached Virginia, they had George in charge of the Ambulance Corps for the Texas Brigade because he couldn't carry the flag anymore. So George was in charge of the wagons and they were mad at him because he would take the ambulances all the way up to the firing line. And they said, you got these ambulance wagons a little too close. And he said, I don't care. I'm in charge of the ambulance corps, and I'm going to leave them here so that way, if the soldier gets wounded on the front line, I can go ahead and take them away real very, very soon. So George went through the Battle of Petersburg, Spotsylvania, and he talks about the final battles. And then, April in April '65, he um, is going back to Texas, and he arrives in Galveston uh, in September of 1865. George lived until 1909, when he finally succumbed to his wounds. And he's buried in Houston. And uh, his son, George Bernard Jr., was another hero. In the 1920s, George Bernard Jr. was in charge of the sewer systems in Houston. One of his workers fell, through the sewer, fell into the sewers. 
George jumped in there without second thought. Both of them died from fumes. And his widow was given a pension for the rest of her life from George Bernard. Now, I was speaking to Patty Bernard Gabino, his great granddaughter. In 1976, she got an email, I mean, she got a letter from a lady in Michigan and said, Are you related to uh, George Bernard? And she wrote back and said, Yes. And the lady said, Well, I have his sword that was given by United Confederate Veterans. And so they drove up to get the sword, and that was given, it was George Bernard's sword. I think it was given by the UCB, not the Texas Brigade Association, because it's a really nice, and I have a feeling it was given by the UCB. But George was made the permanent secretary of the Hood's Texas Brigade Association, and he kept meticulous notes. He was a really good secretary. He knew the paperwork. But George was also a mechanic. He was a very humble man, and he finally succumbed of his wounds in 1909, and it was an honor to the package that let him get the Soviet Confederate Veterans Medal of Honor. But he was a humble man. He was kind of like a favorite of Barna Davis, Jefferson Davis's wife, and she talked about him a lot. And she also gave him a pass to go back to Texas not too long before the war was over. And so he was very well known. Um, there's a painting that's on the beginning of the front cover of my book about George Bernard, done by Gail Gallon. And it has the first Texas black bear going at the triangular field. And the only fault I have with that painting was, it looks like the grass was dry and brown, and brown in Gettysburg, but it wasn't in the screen. But if you see the front cover of the book, you'll see George Bernard reading the first Texas. And uh, the only fault was it was it was not brown grass, it was supple, but it was green. And so Dale Gillen did a good job of that. Um, is there any questions about George Bernard? Or who we? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, he did. He also lost he lost his, his hearing in his left ear, his left eye, his shoulder. Everything happened on the left side. He said nothing ever happened on the right side. He even had a premonition about Gaines Mill. He said, I'm going to get wounded at Gaines Mill on the left side, and he did. But it wasn't serious enough for him to lose the color bear. At Chickamauga, he was also wounded there in, in the left side, but his right side was fine. So he, he said he was always used up on the left, and it was true. And he's actually buried there in Houston. There's a great tombstone that has George A. Bernard, first Texas Secretary, Company LCSA. And so his grave is duly noted. Johnny went to see his grave, so she, so he saw the grave there in Houston. And uh, I think George would be very humble today. He'd probably be sitting in the back there with his head bowed, because that's what happened. Whenever they talked about George, he would sit and he'd have his head bowed, and he wouldn't say a thing. And that happened all the time. Yes, sir. Washington Cemetery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nope. All right. Yes, ma'am. That flag he carried was actually given to him by the ladies of Houston, which included his, his future wife. That flag he had tied up on his flag all throughout the battles of Supper Sharpsburg. Because if it is at like Sharpsburg, it would have been captured. Yeah, there, but, but, yeah. And, it, and it's also in the book, there is a photo, and Hood Texas Brigade Association paid for the restoration. It's at the Museum of the Confederacy, the War Museum. And it was given to him by the ladies of Houston, yeah. which included his future wife, Julia. So that's really nice. And he gave it to, he gave it to, um, to the Museum of the Confederacy when they had the Texas room. That's when he donated it. And it was, I, I'm so glad you all found it because nobody knew, I don't think nobody knew really where it was until you all found out. Rick Weiser, yep. And, he, and it, was in, it was in tattered shape, but they did a good job of the restoration. And you could see it, I believe, still there in at the American Civil War. Oh, really? Oh, that's too bad. It's a really neat banner. Yeah, yeah. And it actually looks a lot like the first Texas flag. It's a star with the white and the red. 
and this is really neat. And he was very, very humble to get it, and he valued it very greatly. And one day he said, I don't know what's going to happen to this. So I want to give it to somebody who I knew would take care of it. So he gave it to the Museum of the Confederacy with the Texas Room. And there's a lot of priceless artifacts that were in the Texas Room. And hopefully they're in storage still. I don't know if they are or not. But there you go. And I want to thank you for your patience. I get nervous when I talk in front of crowds. And today was especially fine. Yeah. Thank you.